Good morning. Brothers and sisters, or let's go the American way, sisters and brothers. Uh, thank you, Darren, and uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, it's really a great pleasure, honor, joy to be here with you today. I had initially a prepared lecture, but I'm not going to lecture today. I'm going to present to my brothers and sisters an experience from our part of the world where Darren, he said he was deployed, I would say, where he was sent as a pilgrim to the holy land of Jordan to work with his Jordanian brothers and sisters. And for seven months, we enjoyed working with Darren and we enjoyed exchanging experiences. And apparently he was insisting to bring his two Jordanian friends here. So it is very timely to thank the United States of America, the military, to thank our allies, to thank the LDS Church for having us here. And I tell you that we needed to come here to learn about what you do, and we promise that we will take what we learned, take it back home. I am an Arab Christian, a very Jordanian, very Catholic. When it comes to figures, numbers, and digits at this era where everything is turning into digits, I tell you that I belong to a very small community, a Jordanian Christian community, which dates back only 2,000 years. The first group of Christians came to east of Jordan around the time of Pentecost. So Christianity existed in that part of the world from where I bring to you blessings from the birthplace of Christianity. The Lord Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. However, our Christianity, the one God, the one Elohim, the one Allah, was proclaimed and we learned at that spot, 30 minutes from where I live, 30 minutes from my house, we learned that God, the one, is a holy trinity. As a Jordanian, as a Christian, as a priest, and as a citizen of Jordan, I took this very seriously, and I value such a very wealthy legacy. It is not enough that we talk about history because if we don't live this legacy, I think Christian Jordanians will be only a very small minority and they will be trying very hard to live with their co-citizens, the majority of which are Muslims, 96 to 97 percent of the population are Muslims. What is left for, for me? If I were to act as a minority, and I am not, because carrying that legacy taking that task, the commitment, 
and the mission, I am supposed, I am called to be a witness of my Lord Jesus Christ among my Muslim colleagues. And every time I talk to the Muslims, I take it on my responsibility, as my responsibility to reflect and to present what Christianity is. I am supposed to be a witness. As a witness, I think I refuse to be the minority because speaking about the Middle East now and these days, Christians who failed to act as a, an integral part of their communities, they are facing problems. And that problem is not caused by the Christians, but it is caused by being a minority and insisting that they are a minority and the, in, the other side of the equation when their Muslim brothers and sisters look at them as a minority, which means they are either isolated or they isolate themselves. I refuse to, uh, to be isolated because in a society where you have a majority and a minority, isolation or being isolated is very suicidal. The Jordanian experience comes from a legacy of 2,000 years when Christianity started in that part of the world. But after seven centuries, the Arab Christians, they welcomed the first Arab army coming from Mecca because that part of the world was under the rule of Byzantium. And apparently, the Arab Christians wanted a new, a new face, a new state, and they wanted what we call these days the self-determination. That's why they became an integral part of the first Arab Islamic community. When I talk about my role as an Arab Christian in a Muslim dominant uh, uh, society, I remind myself and afterwards I remind my Muslim colleagues, brothers and sisters, that it is within Islam a Christian as a people of the book and a Jew are to be respected and revered. Every time I talk to a Muslim, I have to remind myself and remind them that we are here, all the people who belong to God. So it is very timely to be godly in our relationships. It is very Christian to show that love to the Muslim because the way I want my Muslim colleague to act is the way that he is commanded in Islam to treat me. And this is the bottom line for the best relationship between a Muslim and Christian. Growing up in a society, in a community, I remember in my early childhood years, going to mass in the morning at 6.30 to the, attend the mass in the Catholic church parish in the neighborhood. After mass, I would go to school and the first class would be the Islamic education class. And an imam would be in the classroom with, with his hat and with his cloak. He would be sitting there asking who is ready to recite from the Holy Quran. And this little Catholic priest now then 
the, the boy, I would raise my hand and he would say Haddad. And I would do, I would do a reciting of the Holy Quran and I would do it perfectly. That way, I won so many enemies in the classroom. Because the others, they were not as good in doing that, and they would be punished. <laughs> and many of them would ask me, why do you stay here while you can leave the classroom? I am sharing this with you to show that going to the church in the morning and attending a class in my school did not mean to me that I was changing my identity or changing my setting with a mother very Christian mother, very devout Catholic. I learned from her that going to church in the morning means that I have to live as a Christian the rest of the day. And I was showing that to my Muslim colleagues. Taking this experience through the seminary and then to priesthood, I found in 2001 that Islam was a victim and as a very Christian Arab I thought it was my responsibility and duty to fix with the minimum capability that I have to fix the schism that we saw. We started to hear about the West and Islam. And I was out of the equation. As an Arab Christian, I am not counted for. The West and Islam, and where is the Arab Christian? The Arab Christian is there, is an integral part. I have my rights, but also I have my duties. My duty toward my country, toward my church, toward me as a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Working in a community where you have a majority of Muslims, as we have in Jordan, what helped us is the fact that our great-grandfathers learned to be the artists of coexistence. Islam came in the seventh century. We have been living together for 1400 years. There are some dark spots in the history of the region. We know that. But what good would that do to us now and for our uh, generations to come? What good would, would it do if we insist on living in isolation. Your Arab Christian brothers and sisters, especially those in Jordan, they have learned how to play the role of bridging, peace builders. As Christians, as Eastern Christians, who carried a very long history of being there in the Holy Land, they have a commitment and a task. And that is to build bridges. I, I believe what I am doing here now is exactly what I am supposed to do. When I come to the United States of America, I bring to you a case of Jordan. The case of Jordan is the exemplary relationship between Muslims and Christians. And we have never taken that for granted. I share with you another experience. If we look at Egypt, I always, I always questioned why the Copts 
in Egypt, which is the largest, the largest Christian community in the Middle East. They were on the margins of the society. And the reason is because they did not become active in their community, in their society. They isolated themselves. And the Muslim Egyptians did not give them space to act as an integral part of the Muslim, of, of, the, uh, of the Egyptian society until we saw the Arab Spring and the uh, uh, Egyptian Revolution. We started to see that the Copts and the Muslims are working together. What we have seen in the north of Iraq, when ISIS took over Mosul, I tell you that the Christian and Azidi's victims, they suffered not only from Daesh, they suffered from their own neighbors. They suffered when everything fell apart. The neighbors, they were attacking their neighbors. The Azidis and the Christians, they were the victims. So were the Sunnis, so were the Shiites, so were Iraq. Everything became a victim of hatred and the lack of working together. When we talk about Jordan experience, we are talking about an experience that is so valuable for the Muslims to start with. The Muslim nations in this world, they need Jordan to prove that Muslims can live with non-Muslims. And this experience also is very valuable to the region. If we are talking about coexistence between the three monotheistic religions, the whole world now needs that experience when we talk about extremism and terrorism, which is taking the mask of religion. We need the Jordanian experience when we talk about Christians and Muslims. We need it to show that the people of God can live together if they have the will, the faith, and the desire. We have done this in Jordan, and I want to thank here our beloved king, who proved to be really that he is the 43rd descendant of the Prophet Muhammad of Islam. By showing the respect to all the religions and especially by working with Muslims and Christians as his citizens. Not only that, but in the Hashemite school of governance, we have seen that working with Muslims and Christians was always on the top of the list of priorities of that school. After 9-11, after we have seen the schism between East, West, Islam, and Christians, we thought that it was very important for Jordan as a model of coexistence between Christians and Muslims to move. We established the first non-government organization, interfaith-based organization. We established that in 2003. And it was uh, the chief justice, the late Sheikh Tamimi, the top uh, uh, Muslim leader of Jordan, and myself, we established this organization. And in 2004, I was, as the director of this center, I was lucky to take part in the preparations for the first theologically based document written by a group of senior Muslim scholars that is called the Amma message, which my, my brother and colleague, his eminence, uh, uh, Sheikh Touche is going uh, uh, to, to uh, describe to you and to present to you in his remarks. But we took that message, 
which talked about a new interpretation of Islam, a presentation of the tolerant and the moderate Islam, and the relationship between Muslims and the non-Muslims. I was the first to take that document and present it here in the United States of America in November 2004. I was asked here in New York why I was so enthusiastic about the Amman message, which talked about uh, the moderate Islam. I told them it is because I am the very selfish, the very selfish Christian, because I want to live with the moderate Muslims. I don't want to live with Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And I'm being very realistic and selfish, but this is very legitimate selfishness. I took that copy of the Amman message, the first copy to leave the country, one week before its, its ink was dried, I took it, I presented it to Reverend John Danforth, the US permanent representative in the UN Security Council. And I told him, sir, this is the best prescription against terrorism. Because with this, we are, we are proving that the issue is not between Muslims and Christians. It is not. But it is between the moderates and the extremists. Since then, out of my selfishness, I did not stop and I will never stop to work on building an alliance of the moderates where we all come together and this is why we are here. And this is how I became involved with the central command, with chaplains, with generals. It's nice to be around generals, by the way. <laughs> and I came to work with my dear brother, your best ambassador in Jordan at that time, Darren Coleman, the chaplain who carries the spirit of your church, the spirit of your country, and the spirit of love and faith, and he brings it, brings it to Jordan. We need to build such an alliance. And as I am talking to chaplains, and I learn from all of you, but working as a chaplain, I am not a chaplain in the army, I'm not a chaplain in Jordan, but I am a chaplain for the kingdom of Jordan. I am a chaplain for the Middle East and I'm a chaplain for the whole world because I bring, I bring that approach which I believe in, the approach that I use my faith to lead me to reach out and to love the others, regardless of their religion or race. As a chaplain, I think we have a responsibility that we convey the message and to tell all those whom we come across that the message of heaven regardless of our backgrounds, the message of heaven, from heaven, and to heaven is love, and to love thy neighbor. I tell my Muslim colleagues in Jordan, some of them, يعني, some of them, they, they don't understand. It is my responsibility to make them understand. In 2008, I was 
having a meeting with our parishioners and the church ladies, we were preparing for celebrating Christmas. As usual, to bring the children to the church and Santa and the gifts and the Christmas atmosphere and spirit. I asked them that this year we are going to do it in a different way. And that was to celebrate Christmas with our Muslim neighbors. Because Christmas and Al-Adha, the feast of sacrifice for the Muslims, were one day apart. So I called the imam of the, of the mosque next door and I told them, we are coming to celebrate Christmas, the feast of the birth, that's what it's called in Islam, of the birth of Jesus, the son of Mary. He welcomed me and on the eve of the Adha feast, it was a Friday, I asked him that we will go at 11 o'clock, just one hour before the noon congregational prayer of Friday. I had 30, 30 plus people with me. Muslims, Christians, men, women, veiled, not veiled, youth. And we picked the biggest guy in the parish, young man, to be Santa. Sometimes you need big Santa. <laughs> we went into the mosque. We were greeted, embraced by the imam and his assistant. And we walked, we dashed into the mosque. Santa ringing the bell. And everybody was happy. And as we walked in, in one of the corners of the mosque, there was this circle of Salafi group, about 10, 12 people. And on the other side of the, cor of the, of the mosque, in the corner, we had about 50, 60 Muslim kids from the neighborhood. This was their first experience to see Santa. And I was dressed like this. As we walked in, this group of Salafis was led by someone who was dressed uh, and his resemblance. He looked like he was the cousin of Osama bin Laden. He gave me the dirtiest look ever. We are talking about 2008, and you remember that uh, uh, President George W. Bush, it was said that this was a slip of the tongue, but he said that what is being done in, in Iraq and in the region, a crusade. And this is a very sensitive terminology, sensitive to the Muslims and to us. So this was in the, in the mind and the background of, of, of this scene. And this, the leading uh, uh, sheikh, he gave me that dirtiest look. I did not give him a chance to think or to say something because I had the answer. He was surprised to see a priest and Santa and a group of Muslims and Christians walking together into the mosque. He thought that we were overtaking the, the mosque. In the background, it's a crusade. I shouted at him, I said, Sheikh, I mean, I shouted. 
I screamed at him. I said, Sheikh, stand up. Advance toward me. Come. And receive me. Welcome me and my group. The same way the Prophet Muhammad welcomed my ancestors, the bishops of Najran, who came to visit him in his very first mosque in Medina, where he hosted my ancestors in the mosque, when the mosque at that time was the house of governance, was the capital, it was the judiciary palace, it was the place where everybody, besides worship, they discussed the affairs of the state and the community. I told them, come and welcome me, unless you have a different version of Islam. Islam which I know is Islam which respects the Christians, the Jews, and everybody that gave dignity to all the citizens. And I tell you, that gentleman is now a friend of mine. He owns a fried chicken restaurant in the neighborhood. <laughs> I'm saying this, and I'm sharing this with you to show that we have a responsibility. It is my responsibility to explain to my Muslim colleagues what Christianity is. If they don't see, if they don't see Christianity in what I do and how I live and talk, I think I have the problem, not them. When we work with, with others, I believe first we have to have the will and the love for them. A great example was, is your colleague, Darren, who was highly missed by the Muslim imams of Jordan because he knew how to work with them, but before that, he knew how to love them. I believe as Christians, we cannot stop talking about love, but more important than talking is to practice it. As an Arab Christian, I believe that we have to work together with all of you in the region and outside the region where there is so much suffering. I come to you from my country where we have only the percentage of 21% of our population who are refugees from Syria, not counting Iraq, 21%. And we are sharing with them the bread, the salt, and the little water that we have. But what are we going to do as people of goodwill, as people of faith, in order to help fixing the problem? I believe you are the best ambassadors to work on such a solution in our region, which is crying for peace. Coming here and watching you here in Salt Lake, what we saw, and this is my first visit to Salt Lake, we visited the, the Temple Square. We saw what the family means in your practice, in your faith. Believe me, we need, we need to show that respect to the families over there who are the victims. The family is the number one victim of, of this extremism and terrorism. Look at what we have, and you see this on the screens. But living it there is really different because it's more painful. When we talk about coexistence, we are not talking about a theory. We are talking about a message that we need to live and to work on 
and to achieve. Without this, we cannot, we cannot brag about being Christians or about being people of faith and people of God. That's why my colleague and I, we respectfully accepted and gratefully accepted the invitation to come here and to be with you. But I believe it is not and should not be only a one-time visit. We need to work with you and we need you to work with us in our region. We are reaching out to you. We are extending our hand to all of you that you have partners in our region, allies, and more than that, your brothers. We are brothers to you in that region. We need to work together in order to achieve peace because at the beginning and at the end, blessed are the peacemakers. I remember that one day when I hosted uh, a farewell party in my house for the then uh, uh, U.S. Ambassador in Amman, uh, in, the, in the dinner, I had a, f a friend of mine who is a member on the board of our center. He's a Muslim scholar. His name is Dr. Hamdi Murad. I asked him to say the grace in my house. Ambassador Genem had tears in his eyes. He was touched. Knowing the region, knowing the background, understanding the mentality, he was touched by, by that. He saw he saw a Muslim scholar saying the grace in the house of the Christian priest. I was rewarded by that ambassador when I received a letter from him two weeks later after he went back to Washington. He said, Father, keep up that work. Blessed are the peacemakers. As chaplains, I tell you, my brothers and sisters, that the role, that the role of chaplain in the military is not restricted to the air base or the military camp, military base. Your mission goes beyond the barbed wire. The mission is to reach out and to build bridges. We are here to build bridges with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.